Hello, Wine and Dine listeners. This month, we are going to be featuring a winery called Anson Vineyards. This is a family-run winery. And the really cool thing that we found out when we were visiting this winery is that the winemaker originally went to college in Ithaca, is, is from Oregon, but went to college in Ithaca, spent some time in Washington, D.C. He was super cool to call, talk to because he was more in the lobbying, lawmaking side. So we had a little conversation about that and then moved back to Oregon. Oregon and his family farm with very, very deep roots in the area to, uh, which I loved because they actually have that uh, family farm and very deep roots. Of course, I loved that it was deep roots with Rooted Planning Group, but we had a chance to actually talk with them with, with the winemaker when we were there. So much fun. If you want to follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, it's Hanson Vineyards. Uh, so you can follow them there. But one thing that I discovered when I was there was that his great grandfather, winemaker's great grandfather was originally from Norway and moved to Oregon in 1896. Purchased the farm that was across the road from the winery. They then took the winery, then they took the property into a winery in 1930. So that's when it says very deep roots. That's what they mean. Well, let me tell you, we love their wine. Of course, they had a good Pinot Noir. That's what Oregon is known for. But th- today, what I'm going to talk about is their can- the Gammy Noir is one of the different grapes that exists and we loved it. It was unique, it was dry, it was mouthful, flavorful, really savored the wine. So if you enjoy something different, go try the Gammy Red that they have. It's $26 per bottle, good price point. Of course, if you're going to have to have it shipped, there's additional costs associated with it. But we really enjoyed their their gammy. They do have a club that you can join if you're interested. Not trying to sell this company, of course, but I do um, I do really think that if you're looking for something different, um, there's no cost to join, which I absolutely love. If you get out to Oregon, there's complimentary wine tasting for you and your guests. You get 15% off the first 12 bottles each year. And then if you go beyond that, you get 25% off. You also have access to new and limited wines. And they do have some uh, invitations that you can get um, invited to. One is out in July. Um, maybe it changes different each year. And then they um, they do invite you to vertical tastings. Now, of course, we won't be able to be there, but we did talk to Jason, the winemaker, and ask if there's any way we could virtually do that. So we're trying to figure out how to do that. If we learn more, we'll certainly let you all know. Uh, one thing that I loved that Jason said to us is, is whether you're a wine connoisseur or a novice, uh, or novice, I should say, say um, that he's very open to questions and he really truly embodied that so you know he he said no questions are a dumb question and we can usually get pretty deep in the weeds if you want which is what we loved about our conversation so uh, we'd love for you to hop out onto their website explore them we're going to post a link in the uh, Facebook page and uh, if you do happen to buy anything from them and and he wants to know how you found out about us just drop our name Amy and Brent Irvine or Wine and Dime podcast. Thanks, everyone. We hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Every week, it's my goal to share financial information that helps you in both your life and your financial vineyard. We hope it takes you from your roots to the journey of your vines and the influences in the air that help craft your delicious life. Like wine, life and finances have different palettes that should be celebrated and not judged. Welcome to this edition of Wine and Dime with Amy Irvine and Carrie Bean. Carrie, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Well, as I mentioned in last week's show, I am um, returning to New York in the month of May. And so I have mapped out some places that I want to either go explore because I haven't been there or that I want to re-explore because it's been a while since I've been there. And I'm focusing the month of May on one of the Finger Lakes called Cayuga. Uh, Cayuga is one one of the bigger Finger Lakes actually. And one of the wineries that I'm going to hit relatively soon here is Thirsty Owl Winery, which I've actually been to before, but it's probably been, gosh, two or three years. Um... So I will probably be um, heading up there sometime either late May or early June to, to grab some lunch. 
and also pick up one of my favorite wines from them. And it's a rare wine that you find in the Finger, Finger Lakes. It's a Malbec. It's one of the few, few wineries in the Finger Lakes area that actually has this particular wine. It's just not a great growing region for Malbec. The Finger Lakes isn't. But they have some vineyards out on Long Island that they're able to have a long enough growing season. Now, if you're a Malbec fan, do not expect this to be like the Argentina or the uh, Chilean uh, Malbecs at all. It's different because it's a different growing season and the grape has a lightness to it that you wouldn't expect for a Malbec. But I still like it and I'm going to go get a bottle and enjoy a beautiful lunch. Um from there, the view is extraordinary. And um, I think if you're you're heading out on a journey, if you're not from the Finger Lakes area, you can always go to their website, look up the wines that they have, but it's a great reason to come. And it- <laughs> <laughs> so that will be my recommendation for this particular podcast. People can pair it up with um, a Malbec from Thirsty Out. So Carrie, you and I were actually going to be talking about a topic that is pretty near and dear to your heart. And it's probably going to make you thirsty or want to drink. Um, <laughs> and we're done with that. And that is saving for college for early teens. So, um, you know, graduation is taking place in the month of May. That's something that's, uh, or June, depending on uh, high school um, that you're in, the state that you're in, that sort of thing. It's, it's something that's uh, becoming more, you know, probably in the forefront, especially if you have early teens, more in the forefront of your mind as a parent. Um, having gone through that yourself, personally, what are some of the thoughts that you have around saving for college if you have early teens? Um, well, actually, having a fre- freshman in college and then um, my son's 16, and ironically, we had a conversation last night with him. We started talking about it because although he's a few years away, obviously, with my daughter already in college, it's something that we're thinking about a lot. Um, so some of the things that we actually talked about last night were just different ways that we could pay for it. He really wants to play baseball. And so... He, we hadn't had a conversation with him about what a scholarship actually means to, to play a sport. And so we were, you know, talking about, you know, you may get a scholarship for just books or for just room and board or for some of these smaller things. And that's OK. There's there's not a written rule that you have to get a full ride or anything. I mean, those are scholarships you know, that we would definitely take or consider. So just talking to him about the different ways um, to pay for college. So scholarships and potentially academics, you know, a combination of uh, a baseball scholarship or an academic scholarship. And then some of it, sometimes we're just going to have to pay for. So thinking through, you know, what is the shortfall and what does it mean? The other thing we talked about last night was, you know, if you go to a junior college, I mean, that's something that's going to be a lot cheaper too. So just a snippet of the few things we talked about last night. Um, Yeah, it's a lot to think through. And so when you think about the saving for college for early teens, I mean, having that conversation right now with Rainer, I'm sure you had that with Raylan, you know, she was Mm -hmm. probably a bit younger too, but um, what, yeah, I mean, it's great because you're having the conversation, like how much does college actually cost, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about, this conversation that you're having, what, what was the aha moment for Rainer? Like, did he say, Oh, I didn't realize it was so expensive? Or was he pretty aware of what the cost of college actually was at this stage of the game? And is he aware of how much you guys have saved for that? He's not, he's by nature, he's not aware of how much anything costs in general. (laughs) It's just not his personality. So, um, no, he wasn't necessarily aware. And it's something he thinks about. He only thinks about it from a I want to play baseball standpoint. So we were talking to him about when you're, you know, when you're looking at scholarships and different things, how are other kids paying and what are their options and things like that? I know one thing is in some states, like we live in Oklahoma and there's a thing called Oklahoma Promise and it's based on your income. And if you make under a certain amount, you're automatically awarded Oklahoma. Oklahoma Promise, which covers a huge portion of your tuition and stuff. So we talked to him about that. We unfortunately didn't qualify with it for Raylan, and I don't expect that we will for him. But just educating him on some of those different things that are out there. Um, he didn't even know what that was. So, you know, teaching him that and mm-hmm. those kind of things. 
Um, so thinking about ways to actually save for college, like obviously paying for college is, you know, scholarships, some of it's going to be shortfall, some of it's going to be out of savings. Some of it might be looking at the strategy of which types of colleges to, to mm-hmm. attend. I mean, I think the first thing you have to do is build the awareness of what the college cost is going to be. And if you assume that you're not going to get any scholarships, that's going to be sort of the worst case scenario, right? There's student loans that can also be used. There's parent loans that can also be used, which we talked about in the last uh, podcast. Uh, The types of student loans was in the last podcast. So you can go back to the May, the podcast prior to this and actually listen to that. But the first thing is building awareness of what those costs are before you can even start saving for those costs. Right. But, but what are some of the ways that you can actually build into your budget to save for college? So for, for us, we started saving when they were younger and honestly did not save enough. It was one of those things that, oh, well, when we get this taken care of, we'll put more, we'll put more later. And we honestly did. We, we have been, we were fortunate enough that we did start saving when my daughter was young, but obviously it's become a very expensive thing. And we just, we feel very fortunate that we're as prepared as we are, but realize with, with two kids, one will be graduating college and the other one will be entering. So we're going to have eight years of continual college expenses. We don't know where he's going to go, but um, figuring that out. But for, for her, having gone through it already, we have I've been surprised that it has worked out. It's one of those things you stress and stress and stress about. Um, but it's been a combination of scholarships, um, cash flow from us, some 529 college savings account funds and planning that out, you know, not using it all at once and just, you know, making, you know, the first few years paid for and then not have anything. We kind of strategized and said, okay, how can we cash flow some of this and have her pay for some of it and then us pay for some of it and use some scholarships in 529. So that's what we've done with her. And the other thing that's been, I didn't realize was going to be an option was um, there's a, the college offered a payment plan. So we have had that option. But as far as saving, if you want to utilize the 529, you know, that's definitely an option. But even if you can just set back a couple hundred bucks a month in an account, knowing that it may be used for any type of expense, you know, they all they have expenses outside of tuition. So just setting setting that money aside. The other thing that we did that saved us money, it wasn't actually putting, you know, money into a savings account was she took some college classes in high school and in our particular state, or at least our area, we only have to pay the fees. So the tuition gets waived. Um, so she went into college with 15 hours and all we had to pay was the fee at our local community college. So we got almost a semester for very cheap. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing kids can do is um, if they've taken advanced placement classes, like AP classes in high school, then you can take that um, AP test to clip out of um, some classes. So we don't actually offer AP classes at the school where my kids go, but my niece recently, she did. She had taken AP English and she was able to uh, did well on the test and clip out of that first comp one class. So those are some things that you can think outside of the box on. Um, so, so was that counted as a credit to her? Like did mm-hmm. she, so she was able to use some of the, like she doesn't have to replace that with another gen ed credit. She actually got the credit for taking that AP class. So just thinking about the fact that you said your daughter um, saved almost a full semester. Well, that's a, I mean, that could be 20,000 or $30,000. Mm-hmm. That so that's a, I mean, that in, in, in and of itself is building savings into the budget because yes, you're taking some classes and having to pay some fees in advance, but it's saving you a, a pretty good chunk of money in the future. Yeah. The AP classes don't actually cost anything. Yes. I mean, that's something that your high school offers. And then I don't know, I don't know a lot about the actual test that she had to take, but I know it was uh, one test. She went and took it, she passed it, did well and yeah. get three credits for that class and she doesn't have to pay for it. So so she could have started or can maybe eventually start um, her first year with a semester down as well. Yes. What about, what are your thoughts about when you, when I talk about building savings into the budget, what are your thoughts about taking like summer courses and stuff like that to help cut costs in the long run? Because that's yes. sort of a cash flow item. It is. Um, actually, Raylan's going to take two courses this summer online. 
So they're, they're through the college that she's going, she's going to OSU and, and they're through the college, but we're not going to have the room and board. We're not going to have the dining meal plan. Um, so she'll be at home and she'll get six hours. Um, so uh, she's actually probably right now on pace to graduate at least a semester early, just from taking advantage of some of these, uh, online courses in the summer and then the classes she took in high school. So for us, you know, not taking into consideration any of the scholarships she received, but tuition there is, is around twenty to twenty five thousand dollars a year. So right off the top, that's ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars just by doing these little things that have added up mm-hmm. over time. Yeah. Any other suggestions or ideas of, or things that parents that have early teens should be thinking of? I think the biggest thing is don't ignore it. Just start thinking about it. Um, start looking at how much colleges cost. Go ahead and have, you know, you don't want to scare them and make them take ACT too young, but you also want them to, um, or SAT, depending on where you live. Um, you don't want them to be intimidated. So I'm already, I'm making my son take it, take it this summer. He doesn't necessarily feel like he's ready, but I just feel like if you can get some of that nervousness over with, um, and make, you know, the ACT, I think you can take it up to 12 times or something crazy. So just going ahead and addressing some of those things, knowing what your score is, seeing where it falls, start looking at colleges, um, going ahead and starting to save. Even if your budget's tight, it's going to, it's not going to, the, the cost and the expense later on is not going to go away. Um, if you plan to help your child with college, it's, it's going to come at you sooner than later. So just starting to plan ahead and, and don't ignore the elephant in the room. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the number one co- number one tip would be don't ignore the cost. Start looking at costs early and planning not just monetarily, but also like what community service and what activities does the student like and how will that help them with potential scholarships? Mm-hmm. Um, because that is that, you know, it's it, that service or that involvement may end up being very monetarily driven in the long run. Um, another random thing that came to mind is have them apply for a lot of scholarships um, and have them just out there doing stuff. I think just having them prepared and being ready for those kind of things, making them do some mock interviews so they'll be ready for scholarship interviews, things like that. Which yeah, that's falls a into the, Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did a webinar not too long ago with a, a, he's a career coach for high school students. Like that's his job, right? Guys, that's his name. Mm-hmm. And, and he actually works with students to figure out what is it that they, um, they actually want for a career. Cause that's another way to save some money, in my opinion, is that figuring out what the student, what the student actually wants, not what he's or she's been told that she wants, but what she actually wants and what her aptitudes are. And I always joke, you guys have heard this a million times that my aptitude tests when I was in high school many, many years ago said I should be a nurse or a a teacher. And I looked at both of those and went, not (laughs) happening. (laughs) And anybody that knows me now is like a nurse, Amy. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I get the caring side of it. And I get the nurturing side of why probably I got that. And I also understand from an a teacher's perspective, you know how much I love to educate people. But the but from a perspective of choosing that to be like the career, that that those neither of those are in my wheelhouse. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, talking with somebody like fortunately I had, you know, my accounting professor said, No, 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 don't do either of those. Go into accounting. You know, like this is this is something that you're actually good at. This is something you should mm-hmm. do. Um, but you know, looking for those kinds of things too, spending three hundred and I think it's three hundred and ninety five dollars for that coach to work with your student to figure out what might be a good direction for them to go and pursue. And then you said apply for scholarships. Um, that that is something that I hear a lot of people say. Well, where do I apply for scholarships? Where? Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. There are. There's so much information out there. Um, I, I know there's there's some websites, and we can probably link them in the notes. There's some websites that come to mind that I don't have memorized right off the top of my head that we go to. Um, but then also, a majority of Raylan's ended up coming from the college she's going to. So once we figured out where she was going and then applying for all of those within her college, and then we've learned a lot of scholarships she wasn't eligible to apply for yet because she wasn't far enough along in her major. So now we're applying for even more scholarships. So the amount of resources out there is a lot. Um, but the worst thing they can say is no. So just apply. 
Yeah. And I think you just hit the nail on the head with something that I see a lot of, I see mistakes happen with the, they apply for scholarships prior to the first year that they attend, but they don't go back and apply for scholarships every year based on new qualifications. Mm -hmm. That's probably the number one thing that I see people not do. And I don't want to call it a mistake. I think it's a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, experience. Um, we'll We'll get those websites that you mentioned and we'll put them in the show notes for people to kind of look at. We'll also put them in our newsletter for folks that do subscribe to our newsletter. We'd love it if you provided us with feedback, um, shared this with your friends on all the social media, which of course is Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, all those good, um, Instagram, all those good places. But also, if you'd rate us in iTunes, that does move us up the channels when people are looking for it. It sounds like Carrie's dog is working in the background. <laughs> um, this just shows you that we're a real show. We're live and <laughs> we'll try to edit a little bit of that out, but it is, it is life as it is, right? So um, we do hope that you like this. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask, we'd love to include your questions in our asking for a friend section of our, our weekly newsletter. We want to thank everybody for being long-term listeners. We're over 200 episodes now. That's taken some time to build and we couldn't have done it with all of, without all of you. Thank you so much, everyone. And that will about do it for today's episode of Wine and Dime. You can contact Amy through the website, www.rootedpg.com or amy at rootedpg.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at rootedpg for the latest news. And if you have any questions, comments, or topics you would like to hear about, feel free to let us know. And don't forget to rate and subscribe the show wherever you get your podcasts. And again, thank you for listening and be sure to tune in next time.